All right, everyone, welcome to the uh, monthly uh, Viseo Scientific Advisory Board call. We've got a, an amazing call uh, for you tonight, really exciting call. In fact, we've got so much information to talk about tonight. I'm actually going to forego giving all of the bios of our amazing scientific uh, advisory board team. Their bios are on the website. I'm going to be introducing them by their names. Uh, and, and, you know, if they want to take a minute and tell you a little bit about themselves, but, you know, this is our fifth call now, I believe. So hopefully you know a lot of our scientific advisory board members by now and where their current professions are and what they're doing in their careers. Uh, but if you'd like more detail, just go to our website, please. Um, but we are going to be uh, uh, kicking off this call tonight uh, with an, a, a great topic. It's an amazing subject. It's a subject that... Uh, plagues our society nowadays, and, and the subject and topic we'll be talking about tonight is obesity. Uh, we're going to be covering our uh, product, V-Slim. It's an amazing product that's changing literally thousands of people's lives. We've got some amazing testimonials on this product, and I'll be covering a few of those. Um, but I, I'd like to start off <clears throat> uh, tonight's presentation by just uh, uh, giving you a brief overview of, of the the plague literally that obesity is, is causing across the world right now. And it is not just a United States issue. It's every modern and developed country. I can remember, you know, 25 years ago when I was living in Japan, you did not see uh, overweight people at all in Japan. Now when I visit Japan, I see about one out of every 10 uh, people that struggles with that. It, it's been a huge shift uh, in Japan. It's a huge shift in Europe. I've, I've seen it happening there. It is still nothing like the United States. We are the leader uh, uh, in this uh, problem, this global problem. Uh, and, and as a result of that, you know, there are a lot of weight loss scams and yo-yo and diets out there. And tonight, we want to cut through all the hype. We want to get right down to the facts. And we want to talk about the truth about obesity, the truth about weight gain, and the truth about weight loss, you know, how you can actually, in a healthy fashion, lose weight. Uh, and we're going to be starting uh, our call tonight with uh, Dr. Sabo, Dr. Stephen Sabo. Uh, if you are on with us, uh, go ahead and unmute. And, and why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the topic that I gave you is, you know, obesity, what you see in the R E R, uh, what the epidemic is, and, and some stats and numbers, you know, throughout the United States. If you can go ahead and just introduce the call by starting off with that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, Tracy. I, I want to thank you, and uh, happy to be here, and honored to be here with uh, the other members of our uh, scientific advisory board. So, guys, uh, I, I've told you who I am and where I come from before, but I'll just in one sentence tell you that uh, I've been an emergency doctor for 24 years. I live in a suburban New Jersey and I work at a suburban emergency department in New York State. And uh, I'm gonna talk about, as Tracy said, two things, uh, obesity and how it relates to my profession in the emergency department. And um, then I'm gonna just talk for a few minutes on um, uh, some of the impacts of obesity. So let's start with obesity and just define obesity. And, and, and it's really actually quite simple. Obesity means that um, you are 20% or more above your ideal weight. Um, a couple of statistics, and I got this from the American Heart Association, nearly 17% of U.S. kids aged 2 to 19 are obese. And the numbers are really staggering in the U.S. You know, Tracy just said that one out of 10 people in Japan now are obese. Guess what, guys? Nearly 35% of U.S. adults are obese. That comes to almost 78 million people. 78 million people. So it's a big problem. And it's certainly a problem that I see in the emergency department. And what I thought I would do is talk about how um, obesity increases the risk of certain disorders and they just go, by, just go disorder by disorder and, and tell you what it is uh, that I see. And it's really remarkable. And that, that's going to be most of what I'm going to talk about here. Um, so obesity increases the risk of the following diseases, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, hypertension, arthritis, certain cancers, and sleep apnea. Now let me 
tell you these disorders and how they relate to what I see in the emergency room. And let's start with diabetes, because this is the, really the longest topic here. Um, blood sugar disturbances. Um, again, diabetes is increased incidence in um, obese patients. See lots of patients in the uh, emergency department with blood sugar problems, hyper or hypoglycemia. Heart attack. Diabetes itself is a risk factor for heart attack, for stroke. I see heart attacks and stroke in, in my suburban department uh, nearly every day. Peripheral vascular disease, which is a complication of diabetes. That means poor circulation. And uh, this can lead to uh, amputations and, and complications of the amputations, infections, uh, and, and so forth, uh, diabetic uh, foot problems. All of this from diabetes, again, and, and that uh, uh, can be from obesity. Kidney failure, renal failure, dialysis patients. Every single day, practically, I'm seeing patients with dialysis problems, whether it's problems breathing, uh, problems bleeding from the shunt. I won't get into any, uh, any graphics here for you guys. Uh, lots of stuff with that. Uh, diabetics tend to have problems with blood pressure, hypertension. I see that nearly every single day. Peripheral neuropathy, which is basically nerve damage, and uh, patients can get pain or numbness and or numbness to the legs. Eye problems, retinopathy, uh, problems with, um, with vision. See that a lot in diabetic patients. There's a condition called gastroparesis, and um, diabetics can get that. It's called diabetic gastroparesis. Basically what it means is that the food going through the stomach slows down and patients can present with, with abdominal pain. See a lot of that. We have to give medications uh, and there are various medications we have for that. So other types of uh, emergency department visits that I see that, that can come from obesity is heart disease. And um, again, hypertension, we talked about that. CHF or congestive heart failure uh, which is uh, a backup of fluid from the heart because the heart's not pumping properly and you could get fluid build up in the legs and in the lungs. Um, and, and that can be a, a, a complication of obesity. Stroke, we talked about that very briefly. We're a certified stroke center. We see lots of patients with strokes. Arthritis, again, obesity increased the risk of arthritis as far as uh, joint problems. You know, you can imagine that um, people um, who are obese, who, who weigh too much, they put excess stress on the joints and uh, it uh, breaks down the cartilage and gives uh, severe knee problems, severe hip problems. A lot of these patients require trans um, um, hip repla replacements, sorry, hip replacements and uh, knee replacements. And it also increases the risk of uh, osteoarthritis, which is arthritis that you get in the old age rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, fibromyalgia. Um, obesity can also increase uh, the risk of cancer. Specifically, there are actually 13 types of cancer where obesity is actually a risk factor. And then, of course, um, obese people can fall like anybody else, and they can sustain fractures, hip fractures, leg fractures, head injuries, head bleeds, and um, obese people are also at risk for blood clots, whether it's deep venous thrombosis, blood clot in the legs, or pulmonary embolus. That would be a blood clot in the lungs. And again, these are, these are patients that I see every, every single day, basically, with all of these problems. You know, before I move on to the next topic, I just wanted to tell you about a study I saw from uh, 2015 and it showed, no surprise, that senior citizens who were obese had higher rates of both emergency department visits and hospitalizations. And the rates were higher in ob these obese patients than those who were not. And they actually studied um, reports of over 170,000 people. So my last section before I turn it over to the next speaker is going to talk about the impact of obesity on um, on uh, the economic impact and the social impact and the physical impact. So let's start with the uh, economic impact of obesity. 
And uh, I took this information from a, a really terrific article uh, in 2010 from a medical journal where they actually looked into the topic of called the economic impact of obesity. And what they did in this uh, article is they broke it down into four groups, direct medical costs, productivity costs, transportation costs, and what they called something called human capital costs. So the first one, medical costs, they showed that there was an increased incident of obesity-related diseases, and this added to cost. And then there was the direct cost of the diagnosis and treatment of these disorders, again, all from obesity, adding to cost. Productivity costs, the second category, showed increased absenteeism from work in obese people, and they showed that when the obese people were at work, they were actually less productive. They also had increased rates of disability. They became disabled more often. And they also had premature mortality. They, they died at an earlier age. Transportation costs. People who are obese require in, in vehicles, whether that be a, uh, a jet plane or in a car, increased fuel to transport these patients and they also generally traveled in larger vehicles and in addition you know we have the greenhouse gas effect from vehicles and from fuel and it increases the uh, the gases as well and finally the fourth category here is the uh, what they call the human capital costs um, they found that obese patients they they had more days absent from school and they completed less grades in school. Let me move on to the social impact of obesity. And the article that I read from PubMed in 2015, they broke it down into two groups, psychological impairments and stigmatization that were experienced by obese patients. First, the psychological impairments showed that these patients, these people, the, the obese people had Number one, lower self-esteem. They suffered more from mood disorders. They suffered more from eating disorders, and they had an impaired body image. The second part of the social impact of obesity was the overweight stigmata. And they found that um, people experience this in all key areas of living, whether that's growth and development, education, employment, and distribution of health care. They found that obese people were often ridiculed by teachers, physicians, and in the general public, and that they also suffered from discrimination, ridicule, social bias, and humiliation. The final uh, area that, that uh, Tracy asked me to talk about, I, I just covered, and, and that is the physical impact of obesity and as I said earlier, obesity can lead to the following disorders, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, cancer, sleep apnea, and bone and joint damage and accidents. So Tracy, that's, that's all I have. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to you so you can introduce the next speaker. Thank you, everybody. Hey, thanks, Dr. Sable. And that, you know, as I was listening to that, it truly does break my heart to to know and to actually hear those statistics that, that obese people suffer, uh, you know, the social level uh, uh, and the stigmatism that comes with that. I, I totally understand, and I've actually read studies on the economic impact that obesity causes among the workforce uh, and, and literally the hundreds of billions of dollars of increased health care costs by obesity-related diseases. But to actually hear that we as a society still treat these people different it, it is sad it's sad to hear that um because you know we shouldn't as human beings we shouldn't do that uh anyway that 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 really touched me and thanks for sharing that you know it, it is a problem it is a problem among our society we shouldn't discriminate against it but it does create a large economic impact and again i have read statistics where those numbers are in the hundreds of billions of dollars just in healthcare alone let alone, you know, the, the workforce and the, the work environment that you talked about, the loss of productivity time and things like that. That's also in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, so it really is sad, and it really is an epidemic, and it is something that we can't fix. Um, 
Dr. Galicia was going to be talking about this next uh, subject, and since she's unable to uh, join us, I'm going to just briefly touch upon it. And it's, it's actually on what the true cause of obesity is. You know, that there are so many, uh, in my field, being in the nutrition field, and for as many years as I have been in it, I have probably had to answer this question hundreds, if not thousands of times, where people say, how can I lose weight? What's a healthy way to lose weight? How come this pill didn't work for me? Or how come this diet program didn't work for me? Uh, and it really does come right down to uh, a couple of issues that plague our society and that as we age uh, happen uh, to our body. Uh, Dr. Timothy Snyder is going to be talking about metabolic syndrome uh, when I finish discussing this one simple topic uh, here. So he'll be talking about the physical disorders that can lead to obesity, but even before those physical disorders like hypothyroidism and metabolic syndrome and, and those things like that can happen, the simple fact behind obesity is a simple formula, and it's calories in versus calories out. And, and this is what a lot of people don't like to hear and they don't want to hear, um, but it is the simple truth. As our cells grow and multiply and divide, they need nutrients in order to multiply and divide. And if you overfeed your body, you will add body mass. Uh, the more cells you have, the more nutrients you require uh, even. So, and it really does come down to if you ingest more food, then your body needs to produce energy or then you are expelling in caloric output, in other words, exercise, walking, you know, activity levels. If you take in more than you burn out, you will gain weight. You will increase your body mass. Um, and, and again, there, there's been numerous clinical studies on this. There was even a compilation. I was, I was reading a uh, Russian medical journal where this, this Russian uh, uh, medical doctor had traveled the world and had studied from about the 1920s all the way through uh, 1960 uh, in, in Cambodia area, these mass concentration camps and, and um, mass forced labor camps where they were overworked and underfed. And it did not matter if there was type 2 diabetics in those camps. It did not matter if there was hypothyroidism in the camps. It did not matter if, if there was depression in the camps. They were all thin, grossly thin, underweight, malnourished, and it's because in these forced labor camps, they expelled or burnt off more calories than they were given to eat. So it didn't matter the, the human condition or the physiological condition of, of the subject that he was studying. They were all underweight, and it was the simple truth that it's calories in versus calories out. Uh, and, and that's a fact that a lot of us don't want to address. You know, even within my own family, uh, I've had members who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm 49 years old now and, or I'm 53 years old now and my metabolism has slowed down, which is true. But even with a slow metabolism, you have to change your diet. Um, again, you have to watch your calories in versus calories out. Um, and if we don't do that, if we continue to live a sedentary lifestyle and continue to eat empty, nutrient-less food, so we're getting lots of calories but no, energy, uh, no, no nutrients from those calories, then we will continue to pack on cellular mass. In other words, more fat, uh, uh, more fat cells. Um, and so I, I want everyone to clearly understand, you know, if you've been on weight loss programs and you followed them strictly, and you've taken this pill every day that people have told you to take, and you still can't seem to lose the weight, go back to that simple equation, meaning reduce the caloric intake, so make smarter choices. Maybe you can, you can actually eat more nutrient-dense food, more dark green leafies, more uh, a really high nutrient-condensed uh, uh, food, and then increase your... Um, metabolic output, increase your exercise levels, increase your activity levels, and you will start to see weight loss. Um, 
There are people who do struggle with the motivation to get out and exercise, and that may be a depression issue. Again, the topic that uh, Dr. Snyder is going to be talking about, metabolic syndrome, there might actually be hormonal changes or chemical changes going in your body that prevent the motivation or that make it difficult for you to uh, get that heart rate up to where it needs to be to where you're actually burning fat instead of burning just uh, uh, sugar intake and things like that. But those usually, again, are secondary causes of obesity. <clears throat> so, again, if you're struggling with a weight loss program, go right back to that simple formula, calories in versus calories out. How many calories am I burning in this 30-minute exercise or, or one-hour exercise? How many calories am I going to burn on a bike ride or on a swim or on a walk? And that's what I need to limit or go below my caloric intake in of nutrient-dense foods so that I can then start uh, losing weight. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, Dr. Snyder, why don't we have you cover uh, um, a little bit about what metabolic syndrome is? What are some hormonal changes that people experience as they age? And, and sometimes we don't even see it in, in older people. Our youth are beginning to experience this simply because of the sedentary lifestyles they're living uh, and things like that. So I'm going to have you cover that topic, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to sort of summarize my talk uh, in two sentences. Uh, if you're thin, don't get fat. And if you are fat, try not to be anymore. Um, and Tracy, I'm going to uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about metabolic syndrome. But, and I hope that this won't sound a little bit too medical, but I'm sure that it will. And uh, forgive me if it sounds a little bit too medical. But let me just define the problem. Metabolic syndrome is a problem of urbanization. Uh, we clearly have um, excess. We have excess food intake. Um, that leads to obesity. And oftentimes, obesity will lead to a sedentary lifestyle. And we know, and Dr. Sabo said, Fat people have more disease. They have more diabetes. They have cardiovascular disease, gout, hypertension. And metabolic syndrome has been called the deadly quartet. It's been called um, syndrome X. Uh, it's been called an insulin resistance syndrome. But what it really is most accurately defined as a collection of unhealthy body measurements. And that means unhealthy laboratory tests uh, and unhealthy body habitus. So usually it means you're obese, which means your body mass index, BMI, is greater than 30. You are hyperinflammatory. You have high glucose in your blood. You have hypertension, and your cholesterol is too high. That is, by definition, metabolic syndrome. And most of those, not all, but a lot of those show up in people that are obese or overweight. Now, the problem with that is that it really comes down to what Dr. Sabo's already mentioned. If you have metabolic syndrome, you have a five-fold increase in diabetes, a two-fold increase in cardiovascular disease, your risk of stroke goes up four times, your risk of heart attack goes up four times, and your risk of any type of dying early goes up twice. In fact, the International Diabetes Federation has estimated that 25% of the world population has metabolic syndrome. That's just not the United States, that is the world. So you can see we have a true epidemic of obesity and obesity leading to this disease called metabolic syndrome. And it's said that 60% of obese people will develop metabolic syndrome. Now, we have obesity. We know that people are fat, but why is that a problem? I mean, we know that 40% of people that are fat, they don't get metabolic syndrome. What is it that protects them? Well, honestly, we don't know. But we think we understand why 60% of them have all of these complications associated with being fat. And what the problem is, is that being fat causes you to be in a chronic state of inflammation. Now, you know what inflammation is. You take a non-steroidal to cause decreased inflammation. You know your joints swell up. And when that happens in your body, it causes all kinds of diseases. And the reason it happens is because you're growing fat cells. I mean, if you eat too much, and you'll know what happens if you 
if you don't eat and you don't if you eat too much and you don't exercise you can actually see that your pants are a little too tight but what is really happening is that those fat cells are actually outgrowing their blood supply so when you've got a fat cell which is saying hey I want to grow I want to grow I want to grow but it also needs a blood supply in order for it to grow but it actually grows so fast that there's not enough blood to feed in a healthy way that growing fat cell so guess what happens most of us know that if you are hypoxic or if you don't have enough oxygen like a heart attack or a stroke what happens is you set out or you spill or you produce all of these inflammatory they're called adipocytokines and there's lots of them out there and I'll mention a few of them for those of you that understand what these mean but they're things like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin 6 and C reactive protein now why is that important so now we know that fat people produce all of these inflammatory hormones they're sending signals but they're also doing damage in fact we know that fat produces free fatty acids which causes impairment of the beta cells in your in your pancreas to produce insulin that's a problem we know that tumor necrosis factor decreases your insulin sensitivity we know that c-reactive protein which is produced by fat increases your and predicts actually cardiovascular disease we know that interleukin 6 receptors in the brain control appetite and we also know there are things like leptin and other um, adipocytokines that are actually causing things that actually cause us to become more fat so not only does fat produce inflammation but it actually causes you to become more fat along with insulin resistance so you might say well what is the treatment well the treatment has to be like Tracy mentioned it has to be our goal is weight reduction um, and therefore we have to have a decrease in the amount of food that we consume but we also have to exercise because exercise has a whole nother set of good hormones that are released that actually help us to lose more weight but we all know that weight loss is more than just diet and exercise it's also behavioral it's also how do we feel um, we know that if you can just burn about or eat about 500 less calories per day and if you can just do that over time we know that you will actually lose weight and that's well known and we know that with modest weight loss you can yield a significant improvement in your metabolic syndrome if you can just lose five percent of your body mass sometimes people that had metabolic syndrome will be shifted over where they actually no longer have metabolic syndrome we know that if you can do 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity daily we know that you will lose weight in fact that ends up being about 1500 calories per week which means you're going to lose about one pound every two weeks with no no decrease in your diet so exercise is critical but the other thing that I haven't mentioned is when you exercise good things happen to your body your body says keep exercising I like what you're doing you've got to exercise and we won't get into the good effects of exercise but exercise has a very positive influence on insulin sensitivity and when you exercise not only does it work for 24 hours but it gives you increased insulin sensitivity for about 48 hours and it disappears in three to five days not only that but it also releases lots of other hormones things like sex hormones which are good things like growth hormone which is good um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about metabolic syndrome in children because Tracy has mentioned this but uh, we know that metabolic syndrome is being di diagnosed earlier and earlier in children as, as as young as eight years old and if you don't know what I'm talking about if you go to a public swimming pool you're going to see that the kids swimming these days look a lot different than the kids swimming when I was eight or nine years old uh, we now know that children age 2 to 18 the rate of obesity is higher than it's ever been and we're treating more and more children with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease the cost of health care in the United States is going to be staggering uh, if we don't carefully look at what's happening to our children because we talked we already heard from dr. Sabo that the cost of being obese is astronomical 
I heard a study which said that if you have a 65-year-old obese woman versus a 65-year-old normally weighted woman, the cost expenditure over the life of that woman is 60% more. In, in other words, Medicare is going to spend 60% more money on that obese woman than they would a woman who is of normal weight. That, that is a big deal. That is a big deal. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Garcinia cambogia because it is one of the products that is in the SLIM product, and I'm going to briefly talk about it. Um, it is from a small pumpkin-shaped fruit. It's grown in Southeast Asia and in India. And it's really been touted by many people as a miracle weight loss supplement. Now, you got to understand, we will never say that. We know that there are studies that support weight loss, but we will never make any claims like that. But the good news about Garcinia cambogia is that it is an appetite suppressant. In fact, it's been said that it decreases cravings, which is a big problem. Um, it also produces a positive mood. Uh, it increases energy and concentration, and it's been said to stabilize blood sugars. Um, some of the studies that have been out there have been fairly impressive, um, but with any research, um, there are also studies which show that it had very little or slim effect, no pun intended. Um, but there was one study, and, and there were actually 12 studies, which showed a statistically significant decrease in weight in people that used Garcinia as a supplement, and um, it also works as an appetite suppressant. Um, and it's thought to do that by producing a neurotransmitter called serotonin, which is actually a mood enhancer as well. And guess what? If you're happy or if you're in a good mood, you usually don't eat quite as much. It's also been said to stabilize blood sugar, which if you have metabolic syndrome, stabilizing blood sugar is a big deal. It helps the body cells to take up glucose so that insulin, which we know that people with metabolic syndrome are actually have a, they, they have insulin resistance, which means the insulin can't pump the sugar into the cells where it's supposed to be. And the biggest enemy of diabetes is blood sugar that floats around. And that blood sugar actually does something called glycosylates um, certain products in your body. And this leads to advanced glycation end products. Anyway, just know that you don't want high blood sugars it is very bad. It causes problems with every part of your body. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a little bit more about metabolic syndrome, um, and then I'm going to finish up talking about how does this all come together. In other words, how do you, if you're if you're actually uh, in this Viseo group, how does this all fit together? Because it, it really is phenomenal how this all fits with weight loss and V3 and sleep, but. Metabolic syndrome has been recognized as a major cause of cardiovascular disease. The thing that I haven't mentioned that it's also related to female reproductive disorders, non-alcoholic fatty liver, gestational diabetes, poor cognitive function, Alzheimer's disease, certain cancers, and then there's macular degeneration, which is I'm an ophthalmologist, FYI. We also know now that sleep apnea leads to hypoxia, which leads to glaucoma. And that's, of course, right in my, in my area. But the one thing I want to say real quickly as I finish up here is that you have to understand that weight loss is multifactorial, but you also have to think that weight gain is multifactorial. In other words, I don't gain weight necessarily because I want to eat more food and exercise less. It usually has to do with things like sleep and job and hips and knees and depression and child rearing and stress. And all of those things have to be taken into consider, um, and we do. Um, but it is calories in, calories out, but you also have to put that little caveat of why can I not exercise or am I so depressed that those mashed potatoes just something that makes me feel so good. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what is medicine doing to treat metabolic syndrome. The problem with metabolic syndrome is that you've got hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and diabetes, and traditional medicine will treat all three of those, but they'll treat it with a medicine. And the re reality is, is that metabolic syndrome is best treated. I had mentioned earlier that if you can just lower your weight by 5 to 10%, oftentimes you can turn the corner and reverse metabolic syndrome. So the answer really is weight loss. Now, an interesting study, and this I promise is my last little vignette, is sleep is also lack of sleep has been associated with metabolic syndrome. 
it has also been associated with um, obesity. So a lack of sleep is associated with metabolic syndrome, and obesity is also associated with sleep apnea, and sleep apnea is associated with hypoxia, in other words, decreased oxygen, and hypoxia is associated with glaucoma and eye damage. It was uh, one study showed that if you take healthy young men and sleep deprive them, they have a major change in hormones, ghrelin and leptin, which are both cause weight gain, which causes an increase in hunger and appetite. If you look at shift workers, let's say you have a woman who works the night shift, we know that she will develop metabolic syndrome, but we also know that that metabolic syndrome, not only does it lead to uh, high blood sugars, but it can also lead to an increased risk of breast cancer. So we know that women that work the night shift, guess what? They have a higher risk of breast cancer as well. So in summary, we need to change our lifestyle with nutritional intervention, um, and we have to do that with very specific dietary supplements, and that's where we come in. So I think that if I'm, I'm speaking to you and you're out there and you've had friends that have uh, said, gosh, do you have a product? Do you have a slim product? What you can now do is offer advice and support to your clients and offer them products that work together. Um, and these are based in science. I mean, the science is pretty strong that all the supplements that Tracy has put together do support in a very wonderful way um, the production of a decrease in the, in the amount of um, weight that you're going to gain, in fact, the, the amount of weight that you're going to lose. But the other beautiful thing, and I want you to think about this a little bit, is that not only is this about V-Slim, because it's really not, um, I have spoken a little bit about that obesity is directly related to sleep. So we've, guess what? We've got a product called Sleep. Um, we also have know that inflammation causes cancer, but it also causes just about every other disease that we've talked about, and we've got this great product called Renew. So we've also got Core because Core is really what every system in our body needs. And then there's B B B3, which allows you to expend the energy that you need to to actually say, hey, guess what? It's Saturday morning. I'm going to get up and start working out. So I want to express the fact that Tracy has done a wonderful job. Uh, the portfolio of products is amazing. They truly do all work together in a symphony um, that not only allow us to lose weight and motivate us to lose weight because we feel better, uh, but it keeps us healthy on all levels. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Dr. Snyder, for uh, uh, talking um, so broadly on the subject. Um, I think everybody learned a lot. It's actually fascinating to listen to you. Um, I've asked Dr. Baker to talk uh, a little bit more specifically on what role some of these uh, uh, um, ingredients, like, you know, water, proper hydration, how can we maintain bl proper blood sugar levels by using some of the herbs that are in the V-Slim, like uh, Gymnino Silvestri, uh, Garcinia Cambogia. How does coconut water in the V-Slim help keep us hydrated, which helps give us the energy that we need in order to exercise and things like that? Um, and how can all of these combined help with uh, obesity-related disorders like type 2 uh, diabetes and things like that? So, uh, Dr. Baker, if you're, if you're on, can you kind of take over and, and uh, share with us some more about the ingredients in V-Slim? You bet, Tracy. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Schneider, thank you very much. As, uh, that is so refreshing as an internist and a cardiovascular person uh, to have an ophthalmologist that uh, is interested in this and is able to present things on metabolic syndrome so well. So thank you very much for that. Um, Tracy, thank you again for asking us to speak on these important topics. Uh, the, sub the subject that I will be discussing is really a special interest to me for sure because it does have links to cardiovascular disease, which I'll mention in a minute. But I've been practicing in internal medicine for about 27 years now. In the last two years of that, I've focused on the prevention of diseases. As a physician, we simply can't properly teach prevention of illness without addressing this staggering rise in the incidence of obesity in this country, as both previous physicians have mentioned. You know, the Center for Disease Control several years ago said about two-thirds of Americans now are either overweight or obese. That's actually an underestimate. A more recent trial said it's well over 70% of the American population now is either overweight or obese. And let me just mention to you the definition of obesity as well. Uh, someone mentioned earlier about being 20% over 
uh, or your ideal body weight. That's true. Also, a body mass index, which a lot of us go by, if it's over 30, that by definition is obesity. There's a couple of facts that I like to throw out to my patients as I'm uh, trying to guide them and coach them along in their, in their weight loss plan, is that if you have a body mass index between 30 and 35, you have three to four years less life expectancy. If your body mass index is between 40 and 45, you have eight to 10 years less life expectancy. So don't let anyone tell you that obesity in and of itself is a benign process. Uh, we, do live lo we do live less if we are obese, so it's important that we get this treated and addressed in this country. We know as our weight increases, our fat mass increases, we develop insulin resistance, which has been mentioned by both physicians. Subsequently, that also leads to inflammation, which is what is dear, near and dear to me and what I study all the time is, is the inflammation caused by these things. There was a study at Harvard that demonstrated that overeating and obesity causes a stress in a system of cellular membranes that is present in each one of the cells of our body. Those little membranes are called endoplasmic reticulum, which you all might remember from your high school biology. But this, in turn, suppresses the signals of insulin receptors, and subsequently, the resistance to our own insulin occurs after that. And that's just briefly, in a nutshell, how this happens. Let me mention also that the Center for Disease Control as well, one year ago this month, reported that we have finally gone over 100 million Americans now that are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. Estimates are about 439 million worldwide by the World Health Organization statistics. I wanted to mention as well that in multiple endocrinology journals, I go to a lot of endocrinology meetings, uh, that I was uh, very much pleased to be at some of those meetings with Dr. Ralph DeFranzo, which is a very renowned endocrinologist, which uh, he reiterated as well as in some of these, these meetings I've been to, it was stated by others, that we feel 90 to 95% now of type 2 diabetics are obese. So again, there is that definite link there. And I believe, as Dr. Schneider mentioned as well, diabetes can be considered a precursor to cardiovascular disease, which of course is what kills most Americans. Again, my special interest is the inflammation that we're now being, being able to identify. It comes from not only the obesity, but diabetes itself, and then secondarily leading to the cardiovascular disease that we get. That's why in my patients, I measure inflammatory markers in everyone. Some of those Dr. Schneider mentioned, the CRP, the interleukin-6, some of these others that are very, very common. There's probably 15 of them that I test on people. Uh, I've also been asked to uh, talk just briefly about the role of hydration in blood sugar management. It's important to note that proper hydration is essential for all diabetics as well as pre-diabetics. Diabetics can have altered thirst responses, which is common. We see it every day. Also, as our sugars circulating get higher, the kidneys need more fluids to eliminate this excess. As we urinate more fluids that is combined with sugars, then we continue to need more and more fluids just simply to prevent dehydration. As I think Dr. Sabo will agree with me as an emergency room physician, when we have a person come into the ER that is dehydrated, what do we do? We rehydrate them typically with IV fluids. But remember, we don't ju just give water. We typically give electrolyte solutions of different kinds. There are several of them that we use. I worked ERs for a long time as well. As it turns out, the freeze-dried coconut water found in our V-Slim product contains a lot of these electrolytes and nutrients. As a matter of fact, there are articles out there that state that the coconut water from the very young coconuts, when it's still a very clear liquid, is actually very similar in makeup to our own body's plasma. So again, a very good way to rehydrate ourselves. The freeze-dried coconut water is is, once again, good to rehydrate diabetics, pre-diabetics, or even non-diabetics, as most of us probably are. I feel that this component in V-Slim gets overlooked. It's, I, I think it's under, understated at times by most of us, except for Tracy. And I think that's very interesting that he's mentioned this several times, the importance of the hydration factor in V-Slim. I began to appreciate that more as I researched the contents of simple coconut water. It is vitally important 
in our efforts to try to help with weight management in our patients with diabetes, pre-diabetes, or as, as I said earlier, even in those of us that are not diabetic. I've also been asked to briefly discuss one of the other ingredients in V-Slim. It's called Gymnema Silvestri, as well as its benefits in blood sugar control and management. In the Sanskrit uh, language, this means destroyer of sugar. And I think I've mentioned that in the previous talk. While it's not really a replacement for insulin, it certainly is well studied and shows a lot of benefits in blood sugar control. Gymnema sylvester is a plant that's a, it's a woody climbing shrub, actually, that comes from the forests of India, some in Africa, as well as parts of Australia. It's been used in ancient Indian medicinal practices for over 2,000 years. I found it interesting in one of the articles I reviewed, it says if you chew the leaves of gymnema, temporarily it will interfere with our ability to taste sweetness. Because the herb contains a chemical called gymnemic acid, it is very structurally similar to our own body's glucose, which is sugar. So it fills our taste bud receptors. At least for a period of time, we do not have the sugar cravings. So gymnema sylvestri has been shown to lower blood sugars by several mechanisms. One I've just mentioned, just simply uh, saturating our taste bud receptors will help us not crave sugar as much. That's one way. It also reduces the amount of sugar or glucose that is absorbed from our intestines. It's been shown to stimulate insulin release from the pancreas. There was actually a study done in the Journal of Clinical Biochemistry and Nutrition a couple of years ago. It was an 18-month trial I reviewed that showed several of the participants that were diabetic were actually able to get off of their diabetic medications. Gymnema has been shown to possibly protect and regenerate our islet cells, which are the main cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. One article as well said if, if this is taken before a high-carbohydrate meal or a high-sugar-containing meal in general, the carbohydrate, carbohydrates seem to be burned more efficiently and not turned into the fat stores like most carbohydrates are. It does reduce carbohydrate cravings in general to help with weight management. One other article that was totally un related made the point that when mixed with chromium, it actually helps suppress appetite and insulin management much more effectively than, than either one by itself. Someone must have been very smart when they put chromium in with the gymnema. Right, Tracy? In, uh, in, in Japan, it is used in several forms, a couple of which I thought were interesting. They do make up gymnema sylvester in a tea, as well as a chewing gum. And a lot of Japanese, uh, they actually will use either one of these products to help prevent or at least control some of the diabetic symptoms as well as obesity. And I, I thought that was interesting in, in the forms that they're used somewhat in Japan. And Tracy, you may mention more about that if you wish. But first of all, again, I would like to end up by thanking everyone for listening tonight. Uh, I hope each time that we give these short presentations that we all become more knowledgeable about, about the science that is behind our remarkable products. And thank you again, Tracy, for putting these together. It's fascinating as we learn more. Thank you, Dr. Baker. That was great. And, and you know, I'm just going to wrap up by uh, uh, saying I would love for those listeners tonight, if you haven't been to our website and looked, uh, scroll down to the product section, at the bottom of the products, you're going to see a section called Reviews. I'd love for you to read some of those stories uh, from some of our brand partners who have experienced amazing results with uh, the V-Slim. You know, it truly has changed people's lives. Uh, Dallin talked about when he founded this company how he wants to change a million lives and we're going to do a one person at a time. Well, you're going to read that we already have changed thousands of lives in this company with our products and V-Slim being predominantly a life changer in, in hundreds and hundreds of people already. Read that review section. Go to uh, our Facebook page. Uh, you can go to my page, uh, Tracy Gibbs of Viseo Science. Um, where I addressed uh, V-Slim and the major ingredients in there, and I've been answering questions about it. And randomly, people have been posting their experiences with uh, V-Slim. And again, how many pounds they've lost weight, how they've had the uh, energy to get out and exercise again, how it's changed their marriages just because emotionally they're feeling better about themselves uh, and they're a more confident person and things like that. Those are stories that... that we get on a regular basis at the sale, and I'm, I'm 
I'm really happy to be associated with this company and be allowed to produce a product that really addressed the multiple issues behind uh, uh, <clears throat> weight gain. You know, like I said in the beginning, it, it, it is calories in versus calories out, but there is also a tag to that. There's an emotional component. There are true hormone imbalances that, that hinder people from wanting to get out and exercise or emotional instabilities that cause them to eat more than they know they should be. Uh, and, and the V-Slim addresses these three issues. We have a hydration component in the V-Slim. We have an appetite, a patented, clinically proven appetite suppressant that we own the worldwide exclusive rights for in the network marketing industry uh, called Slim Aluma. It's a Caraluma Fimbriata extract, clinically proven appetite suppressant. Garcinia cambogia, Geminum sylvestri, vanadium, chromium. These are all ingredients that when combined ha can have tremendous impact on your energy levels, hydration levels, uh, um, <clears throat> your appetite, uh, uh, I guess you could say your need to, to feed. Uh, they help suppress that. So look at each of those ingredients. Google those ingredients. I want people to be more educated about why these ingredients are in there. So I thank all of our physicians today for giving us you know, detailed information about the economic and social impact that, that this pandemic has in our society, but the fact that we also provide an answer in the form of, of our amazing products like our sleep, our core complete, the V3 and V Slim combo. That's what my wife does. She thinks it tastes better when you combine them, plus it gives her more, her more energy. Um, look at these ingredients. Give them a try. Talk to your friends and neighbors about it that you care for. I mean, these statistics that were presented to you today are real. We are talking about people's lives. Uh, we are talking about our economy and the economic impact. We can truly have an impact on our economy and your friends and family's lives by sharing these products. So, again, thank you, everyone, for, for participating. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, phone call, and we look forward to talking with you next month. Thank you, everyone.